Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm just doing a little live today. It's going to be a bit more of a workshop. So if anyone jumps on live, um, I really want this to be a bit more interactive. Um, and so please feel free to use the comment box. Um, I am pretty sure I'm just having a look to see if that's working. I think it is. So that's all good. So yeah, if you punch in comments um, as I go through this, I will be able to see that. I can answer questions. Um, but I also just want to find out stuff about what's happening inside your body. So this workshop is going to be on or this little live is going to be all about the vagus nerve and the nervous system. So everyone knows Generally, like you've heard about the nervous system, so it does so much, um, pretty much controls our whole body. Um, but when I'm talking a bit more specifically about the nervous system in terms of your your stress response. So um, I wanted to share a little test that you can do at home um, where you can actually test to see if your nervous system is out of whack or not. And this test... Uh, looks at your vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve, in case you haven't heard about it, so you've got your brain, the vagus nerve actually runs from your brain down through your esophagus and into your uh, organs. So it's connected to your heart, your lungs, your stomach, your digestive tract, your liver, um, and it controls all of those organs. And so if people have um, issues with their vagus nerve, they can uh, develop symptoms like fatigue, anxiety, depression. It can also really specifically affect your functioning of your organs. So some people can start having gut issues or you might actually start having liver or detoxification issues. You might start having heart palpitations. So this little test um, is just a way that you can assess to see if there's an issue here. Uh, with your vagus uh, nerve and then I want to share a couple of very easy exercises that you can do at home um, to actually strengthen up your vagal tone uh, which can help with the functioning of your vagus nerve. So I wanted to do that now all over Australia there's been lockdowns except for our little idyllic town uh, island of Tasmania which has been <laughs> lovely but uh, my heart goes out to everyone who is in lockdown again um, I think the restrictions are lifting now um, and just generally any person who is dealing with stress at the moment okay so I want to do a little screen share first of all hmm is this gonna work? Why is this not screen sharing? Well, someone's given me a thumbs up for like my <laughs> awkwardness of trying to find. Um, okay, so, oh, here we go. Whew, I was just about to say, this is Chris's forte, all his technolo technology and his cool microphones and his cool cameras and I'm a little bit behind the ball game. So he sets me up, but he's just left to take our little girls out for a walk. So I'm glad this worked. All right. So this is a picture here. Um, so this is someone's tongue. Basically, it's their mouth. What we want to look at when we're doing is the little self-test is um, the evola right there. So if, you, if you're if you watching this, um, well, it might not work if you're on the phone, but if you're on the computer, you can even grab your phone and you can pull up your camera or you could move. If you're watching this on your phone, you can uh, run over to or where there is a mirror. Basically, you want to have a look inside your mouth. So, uh and you want to see, first of all, that you can see the evola. Most people can, but sometimes people have really big, high um, tongues and it's actually really hard to see your evola. You might also need a little torch for this. So um, uh, like you could use your phone torch or you can get one of those little torches. Anyway, whatever you use, it is easier to have a look at your evola when you're using a torch. So then the next step would be once you can actually see that, um, then you want to press your tongue down. Um, so you can use the back of a knife, a spoon, while still looking in the mirror and with the torch if you need the torch on. And basically you want to go, ah. Uh, when you do that, you need to then have a look to see what this little guy is doing here. 
So basically, if um, a normal functioning vagus nerve or if your vagal tone is nice and strong and functioning properly, which is all connected back to your nervous system and your stress response, that evola, I'm going to use my finger here because you probably can't see mine on this camera, but basically that evola um, should, uh, uh, it should go, it should just move up. So that's normal and not too much. It kind of just like lifts up a bit as you're going, ah. If you uh, notice that your evola actually tilts to the side, so it might go, ah, or to the other side, ah, or if it doesn't move, so if you're going, ah, and it just stays the same, or, and this is probably more uncommon, it actually drops down. Those are all signs that your vagus tone or your, uh, your vagal tone is acting dysfunctional, which can then cause you to have more of an abnormal stress response. Um, it can definitely inflame and stress out your body and it can lead to all sorts of either like brain related symptoms. So the mental health issues, or it can also, because the vagus nerve runs from the brain down to all of your organs in your digest digestive tract and your liver and your heart, it can lead to other downstream um, organ related issues as well. So you might start having bloating or you might start having acid reflux or constipation or diarrhea is quite common. Um, you might be having like gallbladder issues or liver issues or a pain around that area, or you might actually start having heart palpitations. So again, like usually we would then ask, well, okay, what, why is this happening? So digging deeper to the root cause of why this is actually happening in the first place. Sometimes it might be other body systems. It might be the way that you think and feel and behave it might be to do with your environment, your relationships or your lifestyle or the food that you're eating. Um, kind of outside the scope of the workshop today, I really just wanted to give you something practical that you could do at home. So if you want to do that little test, um, if you're watching this now and you've done it, pop it in the comments. Ooh, uh, I've just put a little link there. So, um, so in order for me to see any comments coming through, I think you need to click on this Ecamm uh, link and then that will allow me to see any comments. Otherwise, I probably, I don't think I'll be able to see them. Um, but also if you're watching this recording back, then... Um, feel free to pop in the comments too. So what is your Evola doing? Is it staying still? Does it move up? Does it move down? Does it move to the side or to the other side? What is that doing? Okay, so if you have a nice functioning Evola, then you can give yourself a little clap. That's awesome. And a little pat on the back. Yay. Not many people do. Um, now, in saying that, it doesn't mean that you might not have something else out of whack in the body, but at least you can say, give that little thing, uh, your vagal tone, a, a big tick, which is awesome. Um, if you have noticed that your vagal tone is um, abnormal, then these are some things that you can do. So um, anything where you can stimulate the back of your neck, the actual evola itself is going to help stimulate your vagal tone, but you have to do it daily, if not a few times a day. Just doing it randomly every now and then isn't going to do much. So one thing um, that you can do is like literally just gargling water. So taking a big glass of water, gargling that um in the back of your throat is going to help stimulate the evola, which is then going to help stimulate your vagal tone. It's going to strengthen up and improve your nervous system. So that's one thing. Another thing which I actually don't recommend much because not many people love doing this and it's a bit invasive, you can actually make yourself gag. So you could grab your finger or um, like the end of a, a spoon and if you put that down to the back of your throat, I'm sure everyone has had that gag reflex before, but that apparently also helps to stimulate your vagal tone of We've never had any client actually do that because it's kind of gross and uncomfortable. Um, gargling is much nicer. Another thing, so there's two other things, uh, alternating nostril breathing. I feel like, no, I don't think I did do a, te uh, a live video on this, um, but this is a really simple technique that is really lovely. Um, so it's great for if you're feeling stressed, if you need to ground. Um, 
And also if you have nervous system, adrenal issues, um, mitochondrial issues, uh, gut issues, alternating nostril breathing is probably one of my, my favorite breathing exercises. So basically all you need to do is um, you grab your hand and you want to put your thumb on one of your nostrils and your pointer finger on the top of your forehead. And then you're using your ring finger um, on the other on the other nostril. And basically all you have to do is um, breathe in, hold, breathe out, hold. And it works best if you're doing that on a rhythm. So depending on how many seconds breath you can do, uh, you know, you might be able to do five, six seconds breathing in, holding, breathing out for five, six seconds. I'm going to do this on a three second rhythm just to make it a little bit quicker. So when you breathe in, um, you want to unplug one of your nostril holes. So uh, you're breathing in. On the exhale is when you will swap your hands. So I'm going to pop my little uh, ring finger on my other nostril to breathe out. Um and then keeping my nostril, my ring finger on my right side of my nostril, I will breathe in again. So you're swapping your fingers on the exhale, keeping your finger on the same nostril when you're inhaling. So it will look like this. I already feel relaxed. My vagal tone is feeling very good. Um, you want to do that. Look, if you can only plug in five minutes a day doing that, that's going to be better than nothing. But a good 15 minutes of really getting into that breathing rhythm, like honestly, just doing those, I think it was four breaths that I just did. And I feel whew, quite, quite relaxed. I've been doing consults all morning, just had lunch, got set up for here. So I've been on the go pretty much since I woke up this morning and now whew, I'm actually ready for a nap now. <laughs> I wasn't tired before, but no, I'm feeling very relaxed. Um, so that's the third thing that you can do. If you, your volar or your little um, vagal tone is not functioning properly. The final thing, which is also one of my favorite things to do. Um, it's so much better to do it with other people though. So I don't do it as regularly as what I would like to because everyone thinks it's a bit weird and they don't want to hum with me. Um, I think I just need to find a local place that does humming meditation. If anyone knows anyone in Devonport or Northwest Tasmania, I will be there. <laughs> or if anyone wants to join a humming circle in my clinic, let me know and let's do it. I don't know if it would work via Zoom, but we could give it a go too if there's anyone interstate. So basically humming, um, one, when you're doing humming meditation, you're also utilizing your breath. So you're kind of, you're already switching from that sympathetic nervous system to the parasympathetic nervous system, which is more your relaxed state. Um, and then if you add in the humming, that is also something that helps to stimulate your, your revola or your vagal tone as well. And so again, this can help to strengthen the vagal tone, improve your vagus nerve function, which will improve your nervous system. Um, oh, I forgot to mention one more thing before I do the humming meditation because it goes along with humming, but yodeling. Um, has anyone, I'm sure everyone has watched Sound of Music. So if you just sing that song, I on a hill with a yodel near go to le or le or le Sing that every day for about 15 minutes. Your vagal tone will also get strengthened. Um, so you can do that in the shower or with your kids. Um, but anyway, humming meditation. I did a segue. So humming meditation is where you take a deep breath in and then on the exhale is uh, when you hum. So every time you breathe in, you breathe in. On the exhale, you're humming and you really just, you're humming for as long as you can until you need to take a breath again. Uh, so it would look like this. Um... Um, 
and you keep doing that over and over, again, if you're time poor, you're busy, you got kids to look after, you got work to go to, at least five minutes a day, but you will get the best benefits if you're able to do that 15 minutes a day. Um, so talking about those five different techniques to strengthen your vagal tone. So there was humming meditation, the alternating nostril breathing, the yodeling, um, the gagging, which isn't that fun. And you wouldn't need to do that for 15 minutes, by the way, or the gurgling of water or some sort of liquid. Um, all of those are going to help to stimulate your vagal tone. Um, in terms of the, the nostril breathing, the humming meditation and the yodeling, uh, like you could do those interchangeably as long as you're doing something every day. So it's not necessarily that you have to do 15 minutes of the breathing as well as the humming meditation. You could alternate what you're doing or if you have a favorite thing that you really like, um, that works for you and helps you to feel calm and de-stressed, then that's the best technique for you. Okay, so that is the end of the little workshop today. Um, so I did also want to, and I might try and chop these two videos up when I pop them up in the recording, is I also had some uh, questions come through from some group members. So I had some people message me. Um, I wanted to start doing some Q&As um, Again, we got a lot going on, so sometimes I might kind of clump them with like a little practical thing and I'll leave Q&As at the end. Um, if anyone jumps on live and they have a Q&A like specific to what we're talking about today for the workshop or, or the interview or whatever we end up doing, we can ask those questions, but I'm kind of just bunching in other questions as well. So let me pull up those questions. So I had a question from a mom about melatonin. So melatonin is a sleepy hormone um, and it, uh, where are we? I'm trying to open it. Here we go. Here are my questions. Okay. So the question was, should we give melatonin to kids who struggle to sleep? Um, so melatonin is a uh, hormone that secretes when the sun goes down. Um, so your stress hormone cortisol should decrease during the end of the day, which then helps to um, switch on your melatonin. That then helps us to go to sleep. And so there are a lot of things that can affect our production of melatonin. And so it is a common um, a drug, I will call it a drug or a hormone because it's not necessarily a supplement. It is actually a hormone uh, that you can take to help get to sleep. Um, now I am not against taking melatonin. Um, so in Australia, there's different rules and regulations, but basically you either need a script or, um, you can purchase online for personal use. Um, but my caution with that is that I wouldn't ever recommend anyone take melatonin unless you've actually had a test to show that your melatonin levels are low. Now, even then, um, because you don't want to be playing around with hormones, if you don't need a hormone and you're like chucking something into your system that your body just does not need, that can really play havoc with your own hormonal production. Um, having too much melatonin might also even um, suppress your ability to produce cortisol in the morning. So cortisol is needed to get up to have nice energy throughout the day. Um, so... Uh, caution number one, you'd probably just want to test to actually see if you're very low in melatonin. And before you start popping pills for the melatonin, there are some really simple things that you can do to naturally restore melatonin. In fact, I would say that these natural things that you can do is just as, if not more effective than taking a melatonin supplement um, or medication the thing is people get quick results when they take a pill um, because they don't have to do the hard work or all the, the changes that you might need to do in order to start helping with your melatonin production. Um, but if you are willing to give it a go, these are some things. So melatonin will be suppressed if there's too much light. Um, so at night time, like our family included, we live in what I call the light age. So if there is too much light um, in your house at nighttime after the sun goes down, um, you know, that's like 
bright lights from the ceiling, you got the TV blaring, you got screens happening. That's going to suppress someone's melatonin, especially if that is happening every night. Um, so simple thing you can do is you can turn the lights off. Um, you can either live in candlelight, which is amazing. Like if you haven't done that, do it because it is the best experience. Our family loved it. In fact, my kids say to us quite regularly, can we do the candle experiment thing again? Um, another thing that you could do is... Um, like if candles are a bit scary, you don't want to have like live flames going on throughout your house, especially if you, if you have little, little kids that might be knocking things over, um, just pop on lamps, get the, the yellow, amber light bulbs and just pop lamps on. So rather than having lights in every single room from the ceiling, just pop on some lamps so you can still walk around, you can still do what you want. Um, but those lamps are off. Another thing, both for kids and adults is turn off the TV and turn off the screens, turn off the computers, the laptops, the phones. I know it's harder than better. Uh, what is it? Easier said than done. But uh, definitely these things will affect your ability to produce melatonin. And it's why so many people have sleep issues now. So I always would say at least two hours before you go to sleep, if not after the sun goes down, is the best time. Now, if you're someone who, you know, you might be working, you have deadlines to meet, you know, you have to work into the evening um, or it's the weekend and you just want to watch a movie with the family, that's okay. Um, there are things that you can use to protect or reduce the the blue light that can come from screens. So oh, I should have got them for the Q&A, but I have these really funky, massive pink glasses that are uh, blue light blockers. So if I do need to, or if I choose to watch something um, on Netflix or, you know, I need to do a little bit more work later on in the night, I'll make sure I'm wearing those glasses just to reduce the, the light that's coming in. Um, the other thing too, so melatonin, it kind of sounds a bit weird, but melatonin will also be suppressed if you're not getting enough natural sunlight in the morning. So another thing that I would recommend is to go outside when you wake up and it's winter time now. I mean, in Tassie, it's pretty cold. It's like frosty. I don't know where, what it's like in Queensland or Northern Territory or Western Australia, it's probably quite nice. But you go outside when you wake up, um, that natural sunlight will help stimulate your production of cortisol. And if the cortisol, if your ri cortisol rhythm is working better, that will mean that your melatonin production um, at night will also be better. And also too, because cortisol, the stress hormone interacts with melatonin, um, stress, like reduce stress, emotional stress, busyness stress, nutritional stress, environmental stress, relationship stress, um, all the things that uh, – infection stress, toxin stress, all the things that can stress out your body, anything that you have control of, you want to reduce that. Um, so hopefully – oh, that is, um, actually answered two questions. So one was melatonin, should we give it to kids if they struggle to sleep? Two, how can you restore melatonin naturally? Um Okay. Oh, just one little thing too. We have this awesome uh, free download. It's called the three a day sleep detox. If you are on our email list, um, you should get that. I think within the first day of signing up to our email list or within the first week, we have an email that goes out where you can get a free download for this three day sleep detox. And it goes through all of what I just said. And it's a challenge for you and your family to do uh, three days, live with can live in candlelight after the sun goes down. Um, okay. And I had another question. Why can't I shift weight while breastfeeding and what can I do about it? Um, well, that is a hard one. So some women, Every woman, every mum is different in terms of how their hormones are going to respond when you're both pregnant and breastfeeding. So some women will find that when they, oh, I just realized I'm still screen sharing that. Sorry. Let's go back to the other one. Yep. Some women, I don't know if that's going to, here we go. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. Chris is going to hate me for keeping that up for so long. He's like, oh, anyway. Um, Okay, so some women when they breastfeed, the weight will just drop off, whereas others will um, will struggle to lose the weight 
until they stop breastfeeding or it might just be a struggle for a very, very long time. Um, and that is really all to do with the fluctuations of your hormones. Now too, like if someone's not able to shift weight when they're breastfeeding, then there could be lots of things going on. Are you eating too much for your energy output? So breastfeeding mothers often get a bit more hungrier because you're giving nutrients to your baby. So you might um, maybe subconsciously not being aware of it, um, eating more than what you usually do, even though you might not realize that you are. Like literally a handful of say cashews could put on, if you're doing an extra handful of cashews every day in comparison to what you used to, um, that will stack up over time and it will put on weight over time. So it might be something to do with that. Um, stress also. So again, going back to the adrenal glands, your production of cortisol, these are um, basically they, um, what's the word? They're all to do with your metabolism. So if your adrenals, they're part of metabolism. So if the adrenal glands are not functioning very well because you've got too much stress and I know that a lot of new mums or um, second, third, fourth mums do get stressed. You're often sleepless nights. Uh, you've got other kids to worry about. You're trying to work out how to be a mom if it's your first bub. And there can be a lot more stresses. Even just um, breastfeeding itself is a form of stress. Um, although it, it releases all the feel-good uh, hormones, it is literally like you're leaching, your baby is leaching nutrients from you, which can be stressful if you're not um, topping that up. So there could be lots of reasons for not being able to shift weight, um, depending on where you're at in your breastfeeding journey. Again, like I'm always like test nut guess. Let's, let's actually look to see if there's anything that's out of whack in your body. Like, is it just pregnancy kind of breastfeeding hormones or, or if it is, why are you having issues that your sister didn't, you know, it often means that potentially the female hormones were already out of whack and you're adding in pregnancy and breastfeeding and it can become a bigger issue. Um, now also just a little bit of weight too. Like if it's, you know, one to five kilos extra that you're carrying, that's not a massive deal. You're doing a lot for your baby and you're kind of also, you know, fat is protective in that instance too. So is it something to be worried about? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe if it's like a lot of extra weight, then there's could be a signal that something is out of whack in your body, either with your hormones, um, with your gut or with your detox system is what I would start to be thinking about. What can I do? Well, again, I would probably say like if it's really something that is concerning and something that is above just kind of natural fat storage while you're breastfeeding, then I would start getting into doing some testing. I'd find out what's going on. I would also look at, you know, your your environment and your lifestyle and your nutritional habits um, in terms of like are you eating too much for your energy needs? You could actually track. I hate tracking food, but sometimes, you know, just for a few days it gives so much information about are you eating too much for what you're actually expending um, I don't know if that really answers the question very well. There's just so many different uh, variables that can happen with that, that that is something that would probably require a bit more of a, an initial, like a one-on-one -on -one consult so that we can really dive deep into what's happening inside your body and anything else that might be affecting it. So looking at thoughts, feelings, behavior, behavioral patterns, looking to see... Um, if your lifestyle and your environment is set up for success. Um, okay, so the final Q&A question. So some quick, simple, balanced, family-friendly dinners. Now, this is where I'd love your guy, uh, everyone else's help as well. So if anyone listens back to this recording, uh, feel free to pop in the comments. Um, what are your favorite family friendly dinners that are healthy and balanced? So some of our go to that are quick. Now this is funny. So I'm a nutritional, uh, medicine or a practitioner or a clinical nutritionist, um, specializing in functional medicine, but as a nutritionist, 
I actually don't really like to cook, which is a bit funny. I love food. Like I absolutely love food and I love the way that food makes me feel and I love the way that it fuels my body um, and food makes me happy. But I'm, I wouldn't say that like spending hours in the kitchen makes me happy. So I am always, in order for me to succeed with my nutritional goals, it has to be quick and it has to be easy um so some of the things that we do is I just keep it simple and one thing is I love to cook in bulk so I always make enough for family dinners that are going to last for lunch the next day for me um or Chris if he wants it as well as for dinner for the whole family the next night so that one just reduces the amount of time that I'm cooking it also reduces cleaning because I also don't like cleaning um, and the stuff is there. So if we have a really busy day or, you know, we've got events, whether it's for the kids or for Chris and I at night time and there's just not a lot of time to cook, then we know that we have that stuff in, in the fridge. So I sort of just work out my schedule too um, in terms of, okay, so these are the nights that I should that I can and that I have more time to cook and these are the nights that are a bit more busier so I'll make sure that I have stuff left over. Um, so that's my tip number one. Um, a few f- like actually actual recipe ideas. Well, we constantly are putting up new recipes on our blog and also streaming them into this group every week. Um, But again, I keep it simple. I used to, before kids, would be very elaborate with my recipes and my meals. Like it was something new every day. I'd spend hours looking through the cookbook and working out what I needed to buy in order to make these new things. And, you know, I had the time back then, but now with kids, it's sort of like just whack it, whack it up, put it on the plate, let's eat it. So I just keep it really simple. We have maybe like our five or six core meals and then every now and then I might splice it up with making something different. Um, So stir fries are really easy. Just chop up some sort of protein, usually maybe chicken or mince or uh, sometimes we might make more of a vegetarian type based one with beans. Uh, Lots of veggies. And again, while while I say we have our five or six core products, I also uh, call recipes. I try to make sure that... um, For example, if we're doing a stir fry, I try and make sure that there's different types of veggies so that we're getting lots of variety every time I make it. Um, I usually make my own sauces too. So again, just keep it simple. I chuck in some maybe peanut butter because I love peanut butter, a little bit of honey, some coconut aminos or some lemon juice, stir it all up, chuck some seeds or nuts on top for a bit of crunch. Um... You know, we might serve that with with rice noodles or some brown rice or just have it on its own. So that would be like that really doesn't take very long at all to make. Um, Some other quick ones. I personally don't eat a lot of eggs just because my body doesn't love them much. But this is a really quick and easy thing. Um, Just doing like egg omelets or scrambled eggs um, and with a salad on the side doesn't take very long to make. Um... What else? Mm-mm-mm. Oh, my kids just love roast veggies. So I'm not against potatoes. I love potatoes. So I'll chop up, you know, sometimes I make wedges or roast veggies. But again, when I'm roasting veggies, it's not just potato. I'm always like, okay, what are some new things I can chuck in today? Um, let's do some beetroot. Sometimes I'll chop up fennel. is really yummy. Um, roasted as well. So kind of sticking to the core things that I know my kids are going to like, but then I kind of sneak in some new things for a bit of variety for our microbiome and just to keep things a bit interesting as well. Um, Trying to think what else I do. Salads, lots of salads with like steak or lamb chops. Um, For a bit of a treat, I'll buy some organic uh, corn chips. I think I actually had a recipe last week uh, that was put into the Facebook group, but um, I will do some nachos, but not kind of like the really cheesy, stodgy type nachos. I'll just get some good quality organic nachos and um, grab it barbecue chicken, an organic one that doesn't have like all the yucky, gross feeling and stuff into it. So I'll pull all that apart whack the chicken on top of the nachos and then just cut up and grate heaps of veggies. So like um, 
lettuce shredded, carrot grated, um, cucumber, tomato, pop some hummus on there. I don't eat dairy. My family do um, some dairy products. So, you know, they might have some grated cheese as well, but I'll just whack like avocado hummus onto mine. The kids love it. They're getting nachos, but they're also getting heaps of veggies and it really doesn't take a lot of time, especially if you're getting, say, the um, like organic uh, barbecue chicken. Um, all right, hopefully that gives you a few ideas. If anyone else has some quick, simple, balanced, family-friendly dinners, um, pop them in the comments below or even you can just like privately message them to me if you don't mind and we'll like share the whole recipe um, in our Facebook group. So it'd be awesome if we can help each other with ideas. Okay, I am going to sign off now. Um, so if anyone has any questions, uh, especially in regards to what I talked about earlier with the vagal toning and those exercises, if you do end up watching the recording, and you did the Evola vagal tone test, pop in the comments below what your little Evola did. Um, I would love to know. All right. Have a great day, everybody. I am going to go for a nice walk now. See ya.